in addition to introducing the key disciplines of art, engineering and design. On this introduction to video games course, we're also going to study the history of video games. In this one credit introductory tutorial, we're going to look at 10 games that changed gaming. When I was discussing this with my development team, they were saying this is an impossible task. How can you pick 10 titles? And how can you take 40 years of game development history and reduce all that complexity just into 10 simple games? But there is a point to what we're gonna do in this video. We're gonna learn how games evolved over time and how technological innovation can create gameplay innovation. And we're gonna learn how simple games can be very compelling and what we can learn from some of the games we're gonna look at in this module. So the judging criteria will be, did the game innovate? Does the game have lessons for students of game design? Is it still fun to play today? And as it's my list, is it one of my favorites? So the first of the 10, number one, Space War. Space War is widely credited as the first video game. It was developed in 1962 by Steve Russell, an engineer at MIT, with Martin Graetz and Wayne Witanian. They were members of the Tech Model Railway Club at MIT, and they developed the game with the assistance of Bob Saunders and Steve Pinner. On a computer called the DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, PDP-1, it was designed to show off the power of the machine, to be fun to play and also to be fun to watch. So every version of the game had to play out differently. And you can actually play an emulator version of it online today. So I played a couple of games with my son. The theme of the game is very simple. There's two spaceships that fight to destroy each other. And in the middle of the screen is a gravity well. So you can see here, my little spaceship is getting sucked in and I just managed to slingshot myself out. Um, the bullets wrap around, the spaceships wrap around the screen. So you can fire a bullet off screen and it will come back on. If you fire a bullet off on the right hand side, it will come back on, on the left hand side. And you can see, much to my horror, my son was actually much better at me th th playing the game. I think I got sucked into the well there. And surprisingly, for a game that's over 40 years old, it's still really good fun. So I'd like everyone taking the module to find a friend and just load it up and have a go. So of course, being the first video game, it absolutely meets our criteria of innovation. It also introduced the first joypad and because people were so keen on the game, they were wearing out all the switches on the computer they were playing it on. So they designed the first joypad for the game. And then secondly, there's some great game mechanic lessons within the game. The fact that the game is very slow paced is actually very compelling. The bullets, the anticipation and the planning you have to put into where you're going to fire and when and where the enemy ship is moving and how your ship and their ship is going to be affected by the gravity well in the middle all makes the game very strategic and much more complex than it first appears. Our second criteria, what can we learn from this game? Well, firstly, it shows you what can be achieved with very minimal assets. Vector graphics, two ships, one gravity well, the ability to fire and destroy, and you have a compelling game. And it has one of those qualities that's very important in a game, in that it's very easy to get to grips with and play, but it takes a lot of time to master the game. So for being the first video game, Space War is number one. And number two is going to be a little bit more contentious, I think. Number two is the Williams arcade classic, Defender. Defender was developed by Williams Electronics, an American pinball cabinet creator, and released in 1981. The main engineer behind it 
was Eugene Jarvis, who was one of their pinball machine designers. It started as a Space Invaders, Asteroids clone, but morphed away from those games as the team behind it searched for more ways to make it fun and unique. In the game, you play a space commander in your ship defending a nameless planet from an alien invasion. And one of the great things about it is the theme translates into awesome game mechanics. You will hear Matt and I talk about this concept quite often, theme into gameplay. So let's have a look at the game. Here I am. So the aliens come from the top of the screen generally and they move down to these little humans that you can see on the landscape. And it's your job to protect the humans. And you can see there, if they get a human to the top of the screen, the aliens warp out and they chase you down. So you really have to avoid that. And you have to watch the minimap to see how they're progressing. Oh, I killed a human there. And then you can pick the humans up and safely drop them down again. So there's multiple things to be thinking about and uh, avoiding and strategies to employ. Oh, I died at any given time. And in terms of innovation, it was one of the first games to have a game world larger than the actual screen which is quite an important evolution if you think about it, making a, the game screen a window onto a bigger world. It was one of the first games to have a mini-map, which again is quite important, to have two views onto the same world. And what can you learn from it? Again, like Space War before it, look how elegant and economically it creates a world and a narrative. Look at the other gameplay innovations. It has the basic risk and reward mechanic of Space War, but adds several layers to it, almost becoming a high-octane resource management simulation. Everything is so well judged. It's a brilliant game. The concept is great. The fictional world and conceit is brilliantly realised in the graphics and gameplay. Is it fun to play today? Absolutely. But I warn you, it is rock, rock hard. And you can play an emulation of it online right now at this link. So for multiple innovations and still being awesome today, number two, Defender. I don't think there will be much contention about the next choice. Number three is Pac-Man. In fact, it should really be number two as it came out in Japan in 1980, a year earlier than Defender. But I put it at number three as I didn't play it till after Defender. It was created by Toru Iwatani from Namco. This is a truly amazing game with the most cabinets installed worldwide and the most revenue generated of any arcade game. As for the theme, you don't even really need to be told the theme. You play the Pac-Man, a munching yellow sphere, constantly moving through a maze, eating any of the little pack dots that they find. And the Pac-Man is pursued by four ghosts in the maze, Blinky, Pinky, Inky and Clyde. Clear the maze of all the dots and you go to the next level. And the game is full of innovation. It's the first maze chase game. It also brings strategic planning to the fore. The player has to plan and replan their route every second of the game as the four ghosts adjust their paths of attack. And it has a similar risk reward mechanic like Defender, but it's a risk reward mechanic with several layers of depth. Not only do you have to avoid the enemies, but if you eat one of the four power pellets in the corners of the maze, the Pac-Man can eat all the ghosts and turn the tables. And this is on a timer, and the ghosts will start to flash as your ability is about to wear out. So, so how brave are you going to be? How much risk are you going to go to get as many ghosts and get as many points to complete the level as quickly as you can? Another innovation, it was one of the first games to really build a brand around the character with like cartoon series, uh, merchandise, and he even made an appearance in the recent film Pixels. He's an incredibly well-known game character beyond the gaming audience. He's known worldwide. 
and one thing to learn from the game is that Iwatani was self-taught in code, art and design. So if he can from scratch make one of the greatest games ever made, there's nothing to stop you guys from making some great stuff whilst you're on this course. So for gameplay brilliance and cultural impact beyond video games, Pac-Man is our number three. And you can play an emulated version of it here at uh, free80sarcade.com. I'm actually playing on the 20 year anniversary edition, which contains an emulation of the original arcade cabinet. Number four, Sonic 2. Now this could be contentious, but it's my list, so it's on. Sega's Sonic 2 from 1992. Our dev team voted it the purest Sonic title. And why Sonic rather than Mario? One word, speed, awesome speed. The game was developed by Sega Technical Institute, a mix of American and Japanese staff. On its release in 1992, it became the second biggest selling Mega Drive game of all time and has spawned numerous sequels in the years since. The theme of the game, it sounds really bad, but like, who cares? You're the hedgehog, you've got to stop Dr. Robotnik. He's captured some animals, turned them into kind of cyborg enemies that you've got to try and beat, and then you release them at the end. And to be honest, I think in all the time I played it, I never really knew what was going on. And I never really cared because I just wanted to whiz through the amazing gameplay and graphic levels. Innovation wise, technically the sprite scrolling which enabled the levels to move like a roller coaster was absolutely fantastic at the time. And those levels were excellently designed. It was one of the first games that I remembered that it was really easy to get through a level but really hard to complete it to 100%. And also, the characters were extremely well realised. It was one of the first games I remember actively showing to people who weren't gamers. I took my Mega Drive to my girlfriend's parents' house and everyone was amazed by it. I can remember everyone shouting, he's alive because Sonic tapped his foot impatiently when you put down the controller. And it's one of the things you can really learn from this game. The character design is excellent. If you're interested in doing the pixel art modules on this course, you know, really study this game. It's got some great examples of both landscape and character pixel art. So, for artistic and technical brilliance and sheer speed and enjoyment, Sonic 2 is number four. No surprise and no debate about number five, Doom. We're not going too much into the backstory on Doom as we're thinking about doing a specific history module on it. But, released in 1993, it was one of the first 3D games and popularized the first person shooter. The game followed ID's Wolfenstein 3D and was created in the main by John Carmack, John Romero and Tom Hall. The theme of the game, you play a nameless space marine known as Doom Guy fighting hordes of zombie soldiers and demons on a space station on Mars. But to be honest, the plot was pretty minimal. And there's a famous quote from John Romero about the plot that you can look up online yourselves. And the game might have had minimal plot, but it had loads and loads of technical and gameplay innovation. The 3D technology of the Doom engine was incredible at the time. Also, it introduced first person shooter multiplayer, Deathmatch, to the world. And it innovated in the way it spawned a modern culture letting people create their own levels and upload them online. Also, in terms of marketing, the first third of the game was released online for free, which enticed people to pay for the rest of the product. For me, it was the game that sparked an obsession with making games. When I first played it, it was the way the narrative emerged over the course of the level progression that really fascinated me and really got me interested in making my own games. So, for inventing a new genre, Doom is number five. And in the next video, 
we'll count down numbers six to ten. 